All right. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, but maybe also good evening to some of you. Uh, I think that we may have actually people from all different time zones right now. Um, welcome to our panel discussion on computational social science addressing the COVID-19 reality. Uh, my name is Monika Leszczyńska and I'm Assistant Professor of Empirical Legal Research at Maastricht University. Uh, before we start, I would like to shortly remind you uh, that this event is being recorded and we plan to post it on the SIGS Festival webpage and in the SIGS YouTube channel. Uh, most of us today are already familiar, familiar with SIGS, uh, that is the Summer Institute for Computational Social Science. But for those of you who have just heard about it recently, uh, let me just say that SIGS is a wonderful initiative of Chris Bale and Matt Salgani. Um, it brings together graduate students, postdoctoral researchers, and beginning faculty interested in computational social science. Uh, I happened to participate in the last edition of SIGS in Princeton last year. And this year, together with my Salina Goanza, Thales Bertaglia, and Bogdan Kovrig, uh, I organized the Maastricht edition of SIGS that focuses on applying computational social science in the legal and policy relevant context. Uh, in today's debate, we would like to focus on how computational social science can help design measures and interventions that would address social and economic consequences of COVID-19 pandemic and how this can be done in a responsible way. The COVID-19 outbreak has put an enormous pressure on policymakers, but also on the private sector to quickly introduce regulations to contain the spread of the virus and to address the resulting economic and social challenges. More measures are and will be needed for the society and the economy to recover from the crisis. Computational social science offers tools to assist in identifying the areas requiring interventions and designing the appropriate measures. For instance, analysis of mobile geolocation data and social media data could allow mapping in real time the spread of the virus and help determining whether the containment measures are effective. Using these and other digital trace data can help us understand how the pandemic has affected people's daily lives, like their interactions with friends and family or their working habits. Further insights from data could be provided to identify the needs and challenges faced by vulnerable groups who are hit the most by both the health and the economic crisis. This can be informative not only to policymakers, but also to those less impacted and willing to help. But how to use data and computational social science tools in a responsible way that is providing compromising privacy and safety of people whose data is collected and analyzed? What are the potential risks and threats that might come from the use of this data? I mean, this is not to say that all these issues are very new or particular to the current COVID-19 situation. They had been discussed in, within computational social science long before the pandemic. However, the recent events make some of these concerns much more pressing and pronounced. Therefore, we decided to organize today's debate to not only raise awareness of these issues, but also to talk about potential solutions. Uh, before we start our discussion, I would like to hand it over now to Maria Ferreira Segueda, who helped me organize today's event and who will be also moderating it together with me. Maria is a senior economist at ING who is responsible for the research hub of the Think Forward initiative. Maria will introduce our speakers, but also the support role of the ING and Think Forward initiative in organizing today's event. She will also make some remarks about the structure of the event to make sure that we all have a wonderful experience interacting with each other today. Maria? Uh, thank you, Monica. Can you all hear me well? Perfect. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this online event, also on behalf of ING and the Theme Forward Initiative. First of all, I would like to extend the most uh, sincere apologies from M Mark Cliff, our global head of ING's New Horizons Hub, and also research board member of the Theme for Art Initiative. He was planned to, to open and moderate this event uh, next to Monica, but unfortunately, due to an unforeseen health matter, he can't be with us today. Uh, well, it's, it's been a real pressure, a pleasure to organize this event together with the six uh, people our purposes align very well to a large extent. 
amid uh, disruptive change, and this New Horizons Hub works uh, with leading experts to deliver thought leadership in four main areas, consumer behavior, digital innovation, sustainability, and geopolitics. One of our activities is leading and driving the research hub of the theme for our initiative, or shorter, the DFI. Uh, what's the TF5? The TF5 is a multi-partner, uh, multi-party mo movement, which purposes to bring together research and innovation to empower people to make better financial decisions. ING, Deloitte, Dell, Amazon Web Services, IBM, and the Center for Economic Policy Research, CPR, are the core partners of the TF5. These partners are supported by a network of nearly 1,500 researchers, policymakers, entrepreneurs, NGOs, among others that also share DFI's objective to help empower people financially. We are an open collaboration and uh, we are always looking for potential new members that can help expand our impact. Well, now um, I want to say that uh, both at ING and the TF5, uh, we conduct and commission new solid and data-driven research in both social and behavioral sciences to learn more about uh, people's decision making. All this with the intent to influence innovative interventions and solutions that ultimately can help households and people in general make better decisions, get ahead in life and improve their well-being. While in striving for these purposes, um, the combination of uh, um, and solid use of social science and data science are crucial. And as Monica mentioned already, this be, this been uh, the case uh, before, but now it's it's even more relevant under the present circumstances around COVID-19. That's why uh, today's uh, theme is a very interesting one for us. As many people are seeing their daily lives uh, disrupted already for a while, and uh, several social and economic effects of the pandemic are projected to be long lasting. For today's event, uh, uh, we have a great lineup of speakers, two speaker, two expert and well-known scholars in the field that also have ample experience, collaborated with industry and policymakers for the access and use of different and alternative sources of data for research on social and economic related topics. We have today with us Johan Bowen, professor of informatics at Indiana University and formerly a scientist at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. And we also have with us Dean Eccles, Professor in Communications and Technology at MIT, and formerly a scientist at Facebook and Nokia. Before I introduce the first speaker, let me tell you uh, about a rather simple structure of this event. We will first hear from both Johan and Dean an intro talk of about 10, 15 minutes each, based on their most recent research, but also on their experience on the topic of computational social science to address this uh, COVID-19 times. And after that, we will open the panel discussion and the floor for questions from the audience. We have set up our Zoom meeting in such a way that we can balance the ability to focus on the discussion with the possibility of interacting with the speakers. So during the first part, when our guest speakers are presenting, the audience will have their mics off. And then when the debate starts, you will all be invited to ask questions and raise your hand. The raise hand button uh, can be found under the participants section. When you are called upon, you will be able to use your microphone and interact with the panelists. Um, all right, let's start then. Our first speaker is uh, Johan Bolin. Johan is professor at the School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering of Indiana University, and also a co-director of the Center for Social and Biomedical Complexity. He is also a member of the Indiana University Network Institute and Cognitive Science Program. Last but not least, he is also a fellow of the Synergy Program for Analyzing Resilience and Critical Transitions at WUR. Johan was uh, formerly a scientist at the Los Alamos National Laboratory and an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science of Old Dominion University. He obtained his PhD in experimental psychology from the Fife University Brasil in 2001. He has published extensively on computational social science, social complexity, health, well-being, machine learning, and infometrics. His most uh, recent, uh, recent research covers, for example, the role of social networks and social media in mental health and well-being. He's also worked extensively in modeling the complex relations between economies, markets, and social phenomena, 
as well as the mining social media data for health-related behavior. Well, all this being said, and uh, without further ado, I hand it over to our first speaker, Johan. Um, the screen is yours. Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction, first of all. Wow, that made me sound even better than I am. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, okay, let me uh, do the uh, share screen. Sharing desktop, there we go. Okay, great. Can you guys see my slides? Okay, like I was told about 10 minutes and uh, I'll just give a very quick overview and some closing comments. Um, and then we can open it up for discussion because I was told that that's really what this event uh, is striving for. Um, so the, as you can imagine, the past three months for me since the, the emergence of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic have been filled with sort of looking for ways to, uh, you know, uh, apply our research to, to help mitigation efforts for the pandemic, right? which is a rather unexpected problem. I don't think any of us in 2019 would have expected 2020 to go the way that it, it did, right? And and even if we we had an inkling, like I, I've, I've worked quite a bit with the um, with the group of uh, uh, Alessandro Vespignani in Northeastern. Even if we were well aware of the of, of, of the fact that a pandemic like this would eventually strike, I, I don't think many of us, even sort of from uh, even those of us in the know, had anticipated the the sort of widespread widespread repercussions that the uh, that a pandemic like this would uh, uh, would have on our not just on our economy but also on our, our psychosocial uh, environment. And uh, let me see if I can advance the slide deck here. Okay, there we go. So the the one thing that we have specifically focused on in our research with respect to finding ways of, 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 of learning about sort of the, the uh, effects of the pandemic beyond sort of the biological and economic effects is the, the effects of lockdowns and social distancing, which have proven to be absolutely crucial to mitigate the, the, uh, the, uh, the epidemic in the absence of a vaccine or other sort of a biological uh, and pharmaceutical uh, interventions. Uh, the problem with lockdown and social distancing, as we all notice in our daily lives, is that they're very difficult to maintain. I mean, I'm uh, sort of, uh, I'm, I'm a, I always call myself a raging extrovert. I mean, if anything, I mean, I love being among people uh, a little too much. And uh, so this lockdown and social distancing had a, a sort of a profound effect on my own uh, psychology. Now, the, and this is where I think computational social science can really shed light on uh, the um, sort of so social and psychological effects of, of lockdowns and social distancing, but also pointing towards ways of actually making them more sustainable, because the sustainability of these lockdown uh, and social distancing measures is absolutely crucial in uh, the mitigation uh, of, of the pandemic, again, in the absence of vaccines or pharmaceutical interventions. The problem here that we're facing with is a measurement problem though. I mean, I've seen efforts to, to conduct surveys, but as any survey, uh, the temporal resolution uh, will be relatively low. You cannot uh, have, you know, you cannot have hourly surveys with respect to people's well-being, with respect to their social and psychological um, uh, uh, state. Uh, your samples, by definition, because there's 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 limited uh, uh, there's limited resources, will be limited in terms of the scale, in terms of the locations that you can survey. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the very good science has and, and, and will be done, but it's just in, in, in inherently a measurement problem when you're looking at social and psychological effects because they're introspective states. I mean, how do you measure well-being and mental health indicators other than by asking people how they feel or having them take a, a, a sort of a number of well-vetted surveys, for example, like the, the C, C, uh, CSD that looks for uh, symptoms of uh, uh, depression. Um, the, the other problem that you're facing is that you might actually be confounding your measurements of biological and economic effects. Clearly, someone who's been infected with, with uh, COVID-19 is going to have a bad time also psychologically right and it's 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 difficult to determine whether the uh what you're measuring is really the effect of sort of a biological or economic effect of someone loses their job for example of the COVID 19 pandemic versus the uh the social and psychological effects of the lockdown 
uh, okay, I'm, I'm trying to advance this. So, but, and this is where I think that computational social science can make uh, significant contributions. I'm trying to find a way of minimizing the, no, um, I'm sorry, I think I missed it. No, oh, I'm sorry, let me try to go back here. Um, okay, um, and so this is where I think Computational social science can make a tremendous contribution. I, I'm trying to remove the the, uh, the videos, uh, but I can't because I can't see my mouse. Uh, thank you, Zoom. Anyway, so the what computational social science does by nature of the data that we use is that we can uh, you know examine self reports by hundreds of millions of individuals from, for example, social media records or what we call real world data. Right, that data will be large scale, will be geolocated. Uh, the trick, of course, is to use the right NLP, AI, and ML tools to ex extract indicators of the int introspective states from the online content, which may or may not uh, you know, uh, pertain to self-report. Uh, and the issue, and I'll give you sort of an illustrative uh, uh, example of this, is that uh, it's actually not trivial to compare COVID-19 related content with non-COVID-19 related content. And that's a, a, a particular challenge as well. But still, I think computational social science, especially with respect to this particular problem, has a lot to uh, contribute. I mean, right now, we've got about one sixth of the world population on some form of social media, be it Facebook or Twitter. And one sixth of the world population, I remind you, is a much larger sample than, you would, than, than a lot of social science would be able to achieve either in the lab or through extensive surveys. And for those individuals, we have longitudinal individual geolocated data that pertains to their cognitive, behavioral, lexical, affective, and uh, social status. And so if we have the analytics to extract sort of patterns, models, and insight with AI, ML, uh, natural language processing tools, we can essentially conduct social science. That's the original promise of the computational social science at previously unimagined scales. And so even though that sounds like a quantitative issue, it's really also a, quantita a, 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 quant a qualitative issue because it's not just the, the, the fact that it's bigger, it's the fact that we can perform measurements at much higher temporal and uh, temporal resolution down to sort of the longitudinal individual parameters. Um, okay, uh, so in our own work, we've done, uh, we've been very active in sort of this, this area of using AI, ML, and, and natural language processing in a mode of computing, predictive analytics, behavioral modeling, information diffusion to model well being, health, and mental health. I have difficulties advancing my son because I can't see my mouse. Um, and uh, which has led to quite a few applications in modeling techno social systems, um, particularly from the angle of modeling complex networks, because social media data actually also gives you very pertinent information about the social networks that we weave, right? Perhaps in an artificial setting, but if you look at some of the general principles, you can learn a lot about how people form relationships and how those relationships are being affected by uh, a variety of social economic effects and even disasters. Um, so uh, in our work, we've built quite a toolkit that is suitable to study the psychosocial effects of COVID-19. I mean, for example, in one of our papers, we look at what we call eigenmoods, which are essentially sort of uh, uh, approximations of, um, uh, of uh, mood versus time matrices using a, a, a single value decompositions where we null the, uh, the first or the second a singular value to obtain a measurement of mood, of public mood, that excludes the effects of language itself. Um, uh, I highly recommend this paper that we wrote where you can actually, where we actually showed that Christmas is a very sexy time for most of the world's population. And there's a specific eigenmood that is responsible for that and also responsible for a, a peak in births nine months later. Uh, the my most cited paper is actually sort of in the area of behavioral finance, where we show that the public mood, as measured from Twitter, can actually uh, uh, anticipate uh, stock market returns two or three days uh, later, potentially through the effect of sort of fear and loathing uh, diffusing through the population, having an effect on market returns. Um, the one paper that I'm pretty, and this is again relevant, relevant to COVID-19, is that you can actually use uh, large-scale knowledge networks to do computational fact-checking, where you actually look at a particular claim on Twitter, decompose it into predicates, and then look at how well that predicate 
matches what we know to be true in large scale knowledge networks. So there's been also been this, this pandemic has also been uh, characterized by the widespread diffusion of misinformation about the pandemic, very often starting at the top. So I, I think US leadership, uh, at least parts of the leadership uh, has been absolutely terrible uh, when it came to this. And I think that it's absolutely crucial that social media actually plays an active role in controlling the spread of misinformation uh, to a degree their responsibility. Um, Another, another uh, application, this is where we looked at uh, Google search volumes to model uh, consumer confidence from online data, which is something we did uh, a couple of years ago, which is also quite relevant. We've, we've actually done quite a bit of work looking at sort of how the mood in particular regions responds to disasters such as being hit by a hurricane. For example, in uh, Florence, Irma and Harvey, you can see very different uh, public responses emotionally to speak at, at least uh, in terms of their well-being and how quickly they bounce back after they were hit by a, a major hurricane. You see that some regions are more resilient than others in bouncing back uh, to their baselines. Um, the, the other thing that uh, I've, I've discussed in my keynote is sort of this idea that you can use, uh, look at social networks that people weave online and actually study sort of the, the inherent properties of these networks to determine why social media may make some of us miserable and could very well be through an effect such as the happiness paradox that, uh, that essentially shows that uh, in uh, most social networks, including Twitter, a majority of individuals will experience a situation where they're less happy than their friends are on average and also less popular. Um, the, we've done quite a bit of work in tracking emotional dynamics at the minute scale. We actually look at individuals and look at the moment where they experience a, a strong emotion and then we can actually measure the run up and run down of that emotion at the minute scale, which is previously impossible just because of, uh, it's really difficult to measure repeatedly within subject uh, emotions. And last but not least, I would just wanted to mention that we have actually done quite a bit of work uh, uh, analyzing mobile phone records uh, to study regional uh, economic activity, but mostly through mobility patterns, which has become a big uh, uh, factor in studying sort of the, the degree to which people adhere to lockdowns. Um, just to give you a very uh, simple, and then I'll close my remarks, a very simple uh, illustrative example, something we recently done with respect to tracking the effects of COVID-19 in public mood states. So we had two data sets. One of them, a COVID-19 data set, which was collected by, by Emilio Ferrar and his team at uh, the University of, of Southern California. 86 million tweets that are about uh, COVID-19, recorded from January 22nd to March 9th, sort of the, the Sort of the, the sort of the uh, majority of the US peak, although we're not sure whether that peak is done yet. And then what we did is for each of the individuals that posted anything about COVID-19, we actually harvested their timelines and then geolocated those in, uh, those individuals in 20 of the most affected US cities, looking at the number of cases per 100,000 individuals. So two data sets, one of them just a general public uh, uh, data set of tweets about COVID-19, and then a set of Twitter timelines of someone who mentioned COVID-19 in one of their tweets, but then we harvested all of their timelines, regardless of whether any of those tweets are about COVID-19. And then we perform a latent Dirichlet uh, allocation algorithm to reveal evolving themes of, the, uh, uh, themes of the online discussion, but also a sentiment analysis using uh, Vader uh, of the COVID-19 data set and the timelines over time to measure evolving sentiment. And the results are really peculiar. Uh, let me show you. So for example, in the topics, I'm not going to go too deep in the topics, but as you can see, before tw uh, February 25, if you look at the blue line at the top, it was all about China. US, US audience was not concerned about this at all. It was just something that was happening in China. If they were talking about COVID-19, it was in terms of something happening in China. I think this is also largely true for uh, Europe, although they wisened up a little uh, faster. And then you can see sort of gradually as, uh, 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 as the pandemic started to affect the US, uh, you see topics emerging relative to uh, the US, to lockdowns in the US, and social distancing, uh, distancing, et cetera. But essentially what we have here is a result that essentially tells you what people were talking about grosso modo uh, across that period. Now, the one thing that we also saw removing seasonal effects is a very sharp rise in the use of social media, which is also completely 
expected, uh, expected. So at the point that the WHO declared this a pandemic, you could see a sharp rise, at least in, in our data set for 20 major uh, US cities, a sharp rise in personal uh, uh, Twitter use, which shows sort of a strong need to communicate with others about uh, possibly about the uh, pandemic. Um, but look at this. And this is where I get to my closing remarks. So remember, we had two data sets, one data set about COVID-19 related tweets, and another data set where we had individual longitudinal timelines of the content that people generated regardless of the COVID-19 pandemic. And what you see is that if we had analyzed the first previous, the, the sentiment of the first data set over time, and that's the, uh, the orange line, we would conclude that from this data that the pandemic would have made the US population happier than they were before. In fact, we see a sharp rise in positive sentiment from the start, as you can see, the, the brown zones indicate sort of how many cities went into lockdown mode in the United States. And so the, the conclusion that we would draw is, wow, COVID-19 is actually making people a lot happier. However, if we look at the timelines, the individual within subject timelines, we see a sharp decline of mood happening. And so which are we supposed to believe? If we look at tweets that are about COVID-19, we see a sharp rise in positivity. If we look at the individuals themselves in their individual times, then we see a sharp drop in, 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 in sentiment. So what, what, what could be happening here is that we're confounding Pollyannish effects in how people communicate about these kind of disasters. So if you look at the COVID-19 corpus that we talked about, you see that there's a sharp rise in, uh, in the number of positive tweets and a decline in negative tweets. Right. So what's happening is that people are posting more positive tweets, which is affecting overall average sentiment uh, uh, and skewing it positively over time. And um, for example, here's uh, I looked up some examples. Here's some examples of what happens when you analyze only a COVID-19 corpus <clears throat> or a corpus of tweets that thematically pertains to COVID-19. Flags, downtown, waterfront, honor, community. Your sentiment analysis is gonna pick up on those words and conclude that there's a lot of really positive tweets and people are in a positive mood. However, if you look at the individuals themselves and their tweets that they, they posted something like, I'm tired of sitting in the house and past the point of return. I just wanna go out and be, I need an all nighter with my friends, etc." So what I, the point I'm trying to make is that as computational social scientists, uh, we should try to be social scientists as well, not just data scientists. And very often it's very tempting to just chase the data. You know, someone's got a new data set, let's analyze it and then magic will happen. Then computational social science will magic magically happen. I would argue, and this is not, this is as much a mea culpa as it is sort of a, an admonition, is that we need to do hypothesis-driven science. The data and the tools are important, and sort of an awareness of what's happening is important, but you will be fooled in terms of your awareness of what's happening if you're not careful about you know, doing hypothesis-driven research, where you critically look at the data that you have and look at whether that data and those tools that you use are useful and valid in terms of validating or falsifying a hypothesis that you have you are trying to understand so we need to understand the mechanics and the dynamics of these effects not just doing data science focused on providing statistical descriptions of existing data sets that of course needs sort of a, a merger of theory and applications with a dis interdisciplinary focus um, part i'm very partial to this notion of focusing on dynamics rather than taking individual snapshots and saying sentiment right now is 0.5 in the us look at the dynamics look at trajectories individual trajectories not just features so if you're just using for example a, a classifier you're looking at this data and you're looking at sort of uh, contemporaneous features and you're performing some kind of a classification on the basis of the data that you have even if that data is held up to be ground truth you will be fooled um the the other thing that I wanted to uh, bring here is and something what we're very concerned with, and I think everybody is, but mind your samples and operationalizations. You can do a sentiment analysis of COVID-19 tweets, but it does not mean that you're actually validly measuring public mood, for example, or public well-being. The other thing is that if you don't geolocate your samples, if you don't know where that sample is coming from, you're comparing New York to Los Angeles and you're confounding uh, geographic effects. 
Lastly, as, as sort of a warning against the, the, the wanton use of AI techniques uh, and deep learning, etc. Don't confuse a cat with COVID-19. I don't know whether you've seen this cat, uh, the, the, this paper, I'm sorry. It's a beautiful cat, actually. Uh, but uh, the, what this paper essentially shows is that if you train uh, a bunch of deep learning algorithms to recognize COVID-19 in a set of x-rays, these, uh, uh, first of all, they don't generalize very well. And second, if you present them with unrelated images, unrelated data like cats, they might actually conclude 100% with 100% certainty that it, the algorithm is actually looking at a cat. And the reason for that being is that this algorithm does not know anything about COVID-19. It's been trained on a set of x-rays and it will opportunistically look for features that allow, allow it to perform well on that particular classification task. But it doesn't know anything about some of the longitudinal mechanics and dynamics of how COVID-19 develops. It's taking a particular snapshot of a bunch of features and then blindly, I would say, uh, performing that, that classification. Anyway, so, um, I hope this was useful at all. I, I'm sure it went over time. Did, did I talk for longer than 15 minutes? I hope I did. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. Anyway, I hope this was uh, useful at all, and I'll, I'll just open the floor or I'll uh, pass things to my uh, uh, confrater, uh, Dean. Thank you very much, uh, Johan. It was uh, indeed very useful and a uh, very insightful uh, presentation. I can imagine already many in the audience already have uh, several questions uh, for you to follow up on, on the discussion part. Um, particularly uh, at the, the last message and, and learnings that you share with us are, are, are super interesting. And uh, it tells us all that we need to be very mindful uh, with these applications of uh, data science before we jump too early into conclusions that can be misleading or, or even uh, wrongly used to inform policymakers in, in undesirable ways. And definitely chasing the data or torturing it to tell us uh, what we want to hear, it's as the old joke says, it's, it's definitely a risk. And uh, yeah, this is, this is very much in line with uh, what we believe at the heart of uh, PF5 and ING, that we have to learn first what, what's the problem that we want to understand about before we just jump to swim and, and start looking for answers in a lake or, or even oceans of data. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that. Let's uh, then now um, continue with uh, our second uh, guest speaker, Dean Eccles. Uh, Dean is a social scientist and a statistician. Dean is a professor in communications and technology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and the associate professor at the MIT Sloan School of uh, Management and affiliated faculty at the MIT Institute for Data Systems and Society. He was uh, formerly a scientist at Facebook. Much of uh, his research uh, examines how interactive technologies affect uh, human behavior by mediating, amplifying, and directing social influence and a statistical methods, of course, to study this, uh, these processes. Dean's uh, recent research has covered topics as such, such as uh, social contagion, peer effects, the spread of uh, misinformation online, and the role of social networks. Dean's empirical work um, uses large uh, field experiments and observational studies, and his published papers appear in uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Journal of the American Statistical Association Science, and other peer review journals and proceedings in statistics, computer science, and marketing. Dean completed five degrees, including his PhD at Stanford University. Thank you very much, Dean, for accepting our invitation to speak today. And uh, yes, now the, the screen is yours. Cool. Um, thanks. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so um, yeah, so I, I just thought that, uh, I mean, I, I think we can talk more broadly about um, computational social science um, and COVID-19. Um, I was going to try to do that a little bit concretely through um, uh, a new paper that we have um, called Inter Interdependence and the Cost of Uncoordinated Responses to COVID-19 because it brings together a bunch of data sources that maybe are the kind of things that we might want to talk about in terms of where's this data coming from, what are some of the, uh, the privacy issues, or what are some of the barriers to uh, scientists using this kind of data. Um, and so I want to highlight that this is a project involving a number of people, 16 um, uh, authors, and so it was, a, it was a really, actually a pleasure to, to come together as this 
as a larger group than we usually work in to do this work. And so um, what, we're, uh, what we're looking at here is how um, uh, uh, policies designed to induce things like social distancing um, affect people's behavior directly if I face a particular policy in the place that I'm in, but that there are uh, really substantial geographic and social spillovers of these policies. And we should uh, account for those when we kind of reason about uh, what uh, an appropriate policy response would be. So we know for some other uh, research that uh, domestic and international travel drove the early spread of COVID-19. Uh, and a lot of correlational evidence suggests that um, uh, maybe adherence to social distancing could have actually slowed the, the spread of COVID-19. Uh, what we're going to do is, is not really look at um, epidemiological outcomes. One of the things that I think is important to keep in mind in the context of computational social science and COVID-19 is intellectual humility, right? Um, we don't want to sort of all turn into uh, armchair epidemiologists or uh, maybe even worse, actually being you know, publishing as if we were epidemiologists right away. And so um, I think collaboration with epidemiologists is great. I mean, even those of us who've worked on uh, mathematical models of contagion, I think should be really mindful of you know, what, what our expertise really offers. So one of the things that we look at is, is not cases and deaths, but actually the adherence to social distancing itself. So what's driving whether people are in fact um, staying home or visiting fewer locations? And um, is that driven yes, both by the policy they face and by other factors? Right. Okay, so um, what we're gonna look at is that places in the US are connected in multiple ways. And so if I'm in Middlesex County uh, in Massachusetts, um, I'm going to be geographically connected with other places. There's uh, some probability that somebody from another county is going to visit locations in my county. So that's a geographic mobility index. But I'm also connected to other places in the US socially. So um, I'm friends with, with people on Facebook across the US. And in fact, there can be sort of other patterns of connectedness, right? So um, you actually can see that there's sort of a lot of connection between Boston and the Bay Area and LA um, as well. Um, and so these are really distinct ways that an individual place is potentially connected to other places and may be affected by the policies in those other places and the behaviors of people in those other places. So um, where does the data from, for, for this come from? And I think this is useful for our conversation. So we're going to use two different sources of mobility data here. One is data from SafeGraph. So uh, what does SafeGraph do? SafeGraph is in the business of aggregating and selling uh, data about location. Okay. And so essentially, there's um, uh, mobile phone users who have given permission for a particular app to use their location information. Um, and uh, whether they're fully cognizant of that or not, uh, some of the allowed uses include uh, sharing this data with SafeGraph and that data being resold in various ways. So this might be that you have a weather app installed that um, when you open it shows the, the current location's weather. And then uh, SafeGraph aggregates that data and they normally have a whole bunch of commercial uh, products uh, related to that data. Um, but here they're providing uh, a lot of this data quite uh, readily to academics. And so we're looking at data at the level of, of census block groups, which are not as small as census blocks, um, but have, you know, I think 600 to 3,000 people in them. And so then we use these to construct measures of social distancing. So uh, in a given county, what fraction of devices are not at home? Um, how many census block groups are being visited by people who have that as their home county. So some measure of kind of how many different places within the county are they going to. Um, and we also use this for constructing that um, geographic adjacency matrix that I just showed you on the last slide of how much, um, how many census block groups uh, people from one location are visiting in some focal location. Um, we also use data from Facebook. So, um, Facebook is not in the business of uh, selling people's location data, right? I mean, despite what you might sort of imagine about Facebook and Google, they're kind of some of the main companies that are not in the business of selling your data. Um, and so uh, they have other ways that they monetize that, but it doesn't involve reselling it or aggregating it. So actually, uh, Facebook had 
uh, previously had some uh, um, uh, uh, aggregations of data for academics related to disaster response. And then they kind of scaled up some of those efforts in order to make similar types of mobility data available related to uh, COVID-19. And so these are um, uh, US Facebook users who have a Facebook mobile app installed and location history enabled. Um, and then we are able to look at um, what fraction of users are visiting more than one Microsoft Bing tile, which is sort of similar to are they leaving their home location or not? And then how many uh, uh, tiles are they visiting overall? Uh, Facebook is also the source for this aggregate social connectedness index uh, that we use to, to construct that uh, social adjacency matrix. And just because I think also like the, con the context of industry entanglements, et cetera, is really relevant to this. I just wanted to highlight that there are some kind of interesting industry entanglements involved in the set of authors for this paper in that a number of us have previously worked uh, for Facebook um, and uh, you know, have or have recently had uh, financial interest in Facebook, et cetera. So I think that's kind of worth uh, especially calling out in this case. Um, so uh, we then have these, these uh, uh, adjacency matrices that are constructed from the safe graph data of how much uh, there uh, are people from other places visiting uh, some focal place. And we also have um, this uh, social adjacency matrix that comes from Facebook. We combine this with other sources of data we use weather data for some later results. Uh, we also need to look at um, when different policies are being put in place. So we're gonna look at what the effect of the policy is that you're facing in a particular county on your behavior, but also what the effects are of other people's policies. And so we can see that there's this variation in policy timing in the US. Um, and just kind of in aggregate, you can kind of see that there seems to be some sort of association between the timing of the policy and people, um, uh, staying home, et cetera. So uh, here we're looking at the number of locations that people are visiting and whether people are leaving the, their home location according to the safe graph data for different groups of uh, counties that either are early or late to introduce shelter in place. And it seems like that the ones that introduce shelter in place then have this lower level of mobility. Um, but you can also see that maybe there's a lot of anticipation and overall secular trends that are going on here. Okay, so that's what we're going to try to tease out through using basically a two-way fixed effects model to estimate difference in difference effects of both your own policy and others' policies. Um, and so uh, here, uh, if we look at the top panel, this is the effects on whether you leave your home location. And we show all the results for both the Facebook data and the safe graph data, but the numbers that are called out here are all for the safe graph data. Um, one of the things that's kind of cool about having these two different data sources is that we're able to replicate all of our results with these two different data sources that may have their own idiosyncratic biases. And so I think it's, um, as Johan mentioned, it's really important to think about what are the biases in this kind of you know, big behavioral data that just happens to be available to us. And um, our hope would be that some of the biases in SafeGraph and Facebook are actually quite different in terms of selection into um, whether you're appearing in that data, um, other data quality issues, et cetera. So um, on the very top, we can see um, uh, if your own county uh, puts into place uh, a shelter in place order, this is reducing whether you're you know, leaving your home location by around 3%. And it reduces how many locations you visit by an even larger percentage change. Okay. But that's a model that doesn't include the policies of any other counties at all. Okay. So actually, if we then have a model that's my own county, uh, and also, what's, what's the policy in, in the uh, counties that I'm connected to geographically? Um, then that changes the picture a bit. And so um, a bunch of that mobility reduction that was attributed to the policy in my own county is actually more accurately attributable to the policy in uh, other geographically adjacent counties. And so then we'd say, no, maybe it's actually that the focal county shelter in place is really only reducing leaving the home location by around 2%. Um, it's, but if 50% of my geographic alters, these, these counties that I'm connected to uh, were to introduce shelter in place, that's gonna introduce another uh, reduction of you know, one and a half percent in me leaving my home location, right? So that uh, there's actually a pretty substantial magnitude of these geographic spillovers. 
Okay, but as we saw, geographic spillovers are not the whole story. That's kind of, I think, what policymakers are already thinking about, right? It's like, well, if we're in the Northeast and we have a bunch of these uh, small states, right, like Rhode Island and Connecticut, maybe you want to coordinate their policies in some way, and they sort of all need to wonder what's happening in New York, right, which is kind of the, the largest population state there in that, in that little area. So um, people are thinking about geographic spillovers, but what about actually these social spillovers? If I'm seeing what other people are doing online, people are calling me and saying, hey, well, we're not going out, but maybe you wanna have uh, dinner over Zoom, right? That these are all signals about what other people are doing. Um, and so uh, we expect that there's a, a, a bunch of uh, social uh, adjacency spillovers as well. So now we consider models that include not only your geographically adjacent counties, but also your socially adjacent counties. Um, and this matrix is basically what fraction of a random person in the focal county, what fraction of their Facebook friend list is people in this other county. And so that's the weighting function that we're applying here. And so uh, if we look at the results here, we basically have the model that I just showed you before. Um, and that's the ones that are filled uh, in black. And then the ones that are filled in gray, uh, these are the estimates from a model that incorporates not only uh, uh, geographic spillovers, but also social spillovers. And so here we're, we're breaking it down by your own state versus other states. Uh, and so we see that actually these policy spillover estimates are um, over two times as large if we're um, accounting uh, for the social spillovers rather than just the ge geographic spillovers. And if around a third of a state's geographic and social peers implemented shelter in place, this would reduce mobility as much as if the state itself actually introduces shelter in place. That's, the, that's what these point estimates are suggesting here, right? So I think there's, I mean, I wanna highlight there's a lot of potential caveats that go into this interpretation, right? We have this, just this difference in difference model that is the basis of this inference. If you wanna dig into all the details and some of the assumptions that we're able to check about that, um, check out the paper and the, 100 page long supporting information. Um, but um, I think this is certainly quite suggestive that there are these very large um, social and geographical spillovers. Um, one of the things we wanted to do was like unpack why are these spillovers happening? So one of our hypotheses is that it's because um, you're seeing what other people are doing. It's not that I'm responding directly to the policy in some other state. I'm responding to how other people are behaving because that's pres that, that's being shown on social media, et cetera. And so in order to do that, we look for some additional independent sources of variation in their behavior. So we look at whether your friends are less likely to visit more locations yeah. if they, um, and less likely to leave home if it's yeah, raining, yeah. et cetera. So we look at precipitation. We also look at um, the industry mix in that um, uh, county. So to what degree does that county normally uh, is that normally a place where people are going to a lot of arts, entertainment, and recreation locations? And we use these to construct kind of so-called shift share instruments. So these provide us with some independent sources of variation in whether other counties are leaving home. So I won't go into the details on that, but essentially this allows us to, to estimate um, how much actually the reduction in peers um, leaving their home location um, uh, sorry, the reduction in, in how many locations are visiting or their peer, the peers staying in their home location is affecting my behavior. And so we see that these social spillovers that we saw before are really substantially mediated by these peer behaviors. And so a lot of the reduction we may want to attribute to that I'm seeing what other peers are doing and I'm responding to that in my behavior. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, that's kind of all that I wanna highlight for now in terms of the results. There's a bit more in the paper, uh, but one of the things that this sort of suggests is this map of which states are influenced by which other states, like which uh, states have the most influence on Florida. Some of this is geographic, yes, we've got Georgia in there, but a bunch of it is social. We've got New York in there, right? And if you know much about New York and Florida, there's you know, a lot of people whose you know, parents have moved down to Florida, for example, right? So um, there, there are reasons that these are connected um, and that these social spillovers need to be accounted for. One of the things I'm not gonna have time to talk about is how this actually matters for the cost of lack of, of, lack of coordination, right? That this means that uh, the resulting mobility reductions 
are uh, different than what you'd achieve if you were able to coordinate more across states. Um, so I'm just going to conclude with that and um, and say um, this it was a really great project to work on with uh, my 15 uh, co-authors um, and uh, and I think maybe this illustrates some promise of the source the source of these uh, the data that we're talking about here. But I think we'll have plenty more to discuss about that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean, for your presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, I mean, also like for policymakers, but I think that this this effect of showing also these social uh, spillovers is really amazing. It's really interesting. Uh, now, uh, we do have like almost, I think, like 30 minutes for the discussion, 25 minutes for the discussion. We have some comments with Maria to you. We, we really want, we're eager to ask you like some, some more questions, but maybe we can open the floor to, uh, to, our, um, to our audience right away. So if you want to ask questions to Johan and Dean, please raise your hand. You can see the raise hand button in under the participant list. Uh, and once we see you raising your hand, we will uh, allow you to ask your question yourself. I saw a question already in the chat uh, from Laura Fernanda, uh, but I saw that uh, Johan already answered it, or would you like to address it uh, immediately? Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Dean, that was during your presentation. I figured to, to just briefly answer it in the interest of time, but yeah. Johan, would you like to address it? Yeah, sure. I, I, I posted in the, uh, in the in the chat room, and I think that was uh, uh, for everyone. So uh, Laura was asking uh, about my concern about being aware of local dynamics, and you know, it's it's it, it's actually funny how the, the dean's talk is almost just perfectly making that 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 point. Uh, um, and um, but it's not easy to access geo uh, geo coded data. I mean, specifically in Twitter. You know, it's 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 uh, it's an opt-in field, right? And if I'm not mistaken, Twitter actually changed from opt-in to opt-out and back to opt-in within the span of uh, a couple of months. And so, yeah, the data isn't very reliable, and it's not always uh, available. But yeah, I mean, if 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 you have an understanding of the phenomenon, if you have a hypothesis, and you know that geolocation factors into the dynamics of the phenomenon, then yeah, I prefer a smaller sample uh, with validated uh, uh, geolocation, uh, uh, geographic data. And uh, in the past, we've we've actually had many of our students involved in in large scale efforts of actually looking at user accounts and then manually verifying and validating and vetting the locations of those users, including a number of other parameters. So. Uh, I mean, I, I, that's why I mentioned sort of this interdisciplinary marriage between sort of computational techniques and social science, because uh, we actually do a lot of, you know, manual vetting and rating of our data, uh, just to make sure that we have good validity of our sample, um, even with respect to geolocation. Uh, but yeah, it is a challenge. It's not, I mean, it's not like you could take a Twitter data set and then expect good coverage in terms of the geolocation that the data set offers. That's just not available. We have already the next question from Kempi from Rotterdam. Uh, I will unmute you right now and you can ask your question. Yes, uh, good, uh, good afternoon or good morning. Um, yes, I've seen some slides of Dean about the effect of social distancing on policies on mobility. Uh, as I'm from outside the US, I'm really wonder whether you can use these data and predictions to predict how many people will vote on the 3rd of November. Um, I'm not sure that we can use this exact data uh, to predict that, but I think we know that there are substantial uh, social spillovers in voting. So I think uh, really a classic um, field experiment that demonstrated uh, social um, uh, spillovers in, in voting is this work by Nickerson that they looked at how if you contact one person in a household, how that can end up uh, spilling over to whether other people in that household get out to vote. Uh, and then some follow-up work, uh, one of the versions of which I was involved in, looked at uh, social spillovers via Facebook um, uh, of get out the vote messages. 
And so uh, certainly I think that there's this, there's the same kind of substantial social spillover dimension to those get out the vote efforts. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, one of the big challenges that um, political campaigns face uh, compared with say other marketing campaigns is that they uh, don't get uh, co more continuous feedback, right? About how things are going. So yes, you get polling numbers, but you don't know how that's gonna translate. People say they're gonna vote, are they really gonna vote? Um, uh, whereas in a lot of marketing campaigns, you're potentially marketing your product over time and you're seeing uh, sales information over time uh, and in response to potentially randomized camp uh, campaign content, et cetera, right? Uh, in political science, they don't really have that. There's sort of this, this big question mark around how things that have happened during the campaign, some of the surrogate indicators that they've used are gonna translate into actual turnout. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a big challenge. And I think it's very, it can be very difficult to calibrate those models uh, correctly, especially uh, in this kind of uh, um, uh, you know, new context. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, three more questions from four rating Athens, and I see two questions in the chat. Maybe we'll take one more from uh, Guidance Mutuasi. Uh, I will unmute you right now. You can ask your question. Okay, uh, thank you very much, and hello to everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. It's so, nice. um, I'm in, I'm in the I'm in the middle. We are in the middle of uh, doing um, um, uh, some project to do with solutions for school um, school uh, primary school children or primary school students uh, their safety during this um, COVID nineteen. And I was wondering, since uh, perhaps I can direct this to both Dean and uh, to, uh, Johan. Uh, that uh, since you are using uh, Facebook and Twitter data, how would you be, can, is there a way where we can be able to uh, coin solutions from that data to, to, to have, um, you know, some solutions directed strictly uh, to, directed to the primary school children as to how they can be protected, how they can maintain these social distancing and stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Maybe I'll, I'll have one initial answer, which is that, uh, and this highlights some of the biases of this kind of big behavioral data, right? Is um, a bunch of primary school children uh, may not have cell phones. And um, uh, in the US, for example, um, privacy regulations uh, should basically prevent them from uh, signing up for Facebook. A lot of them know to lie about their age, right? Um, or maybe their parents are even telling them to lie about their age in order to sign up for some of these services. Um, so, uh, but uh, basically it's, it's very difficult uh, to have some of the same kind of mobility data uh, in that setting. I think to a large degree, that may be a good thing, right? The idea that there's not all this detailed location trace data uh, being used for targeted advertising, right? That was part of the intention of some of the regulations that made it difficult for uh, children to sign up for these services. But it does have this consequence that, say, when we, uh, you know, would look at uh, school closure data and how that's affecting mobility, you're mainly seeing the mobility trace in parents' behavior or in older children, right? You're not seeing it in younger children. And to the extent that you are, it's a really especially bizarre sample of children that may be weighted towards children who, for whatever reason, have cell phones, uh, mobile phones, um, you know, with uh, that are in this location trace data. So that's that's one piece of that. Yeah, if, if I could just chime in, I mean, that's I mean, that's obviously a problem, right? I mean, I I made. Uh... A uh, comment about not chasing the data, but in this case, the data, I mean, might not the bias the sample towards age groups that, that, that uh, you know, that are just not, uh, uh, that are not of interest in this case, right? And uh, as Dean mentioned, I mean, I think most uh, regulations would prevent, uh, prevent you from, uh, from tracing 
uh, children of uh, school age children. And so the, yeah, I mean, the, the, there's definitely limits to this, sort of these data driven approaches. And in, in that case, you might have to simply do what uh, my colleagues at the ISI Foundation have done in the past, namely that you distribute uh, sort of con contact trace tracing bracelets and distribute them through an entire village, including the, the I mean, all age groups in the village and then simply trace contacts throughout the village for an extended period of time. And, but this is where, again, you're not relying on social media day, which is not the end all be all of computational social science. I think we shouldn't get, be fooled in thinking that computational social science is about Twitter, analyzing Twitter and Facebook data, because obviously the data has significant shortcomings in terms of its coverage of, for example, uh, gender, uh, age, uh, there's also economic uh, biases involved. Not everybody has the money to spend on a fancy iPhone. And so uh, that's where you simply have to do the groundwork and sometimes even build uh, 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 you know, sort of recording devices that you can distribute to large uh, groups of individuals to obtain the data that you need to study that, that particular phenomenon. So, And I guess I would chime in on that and say that some of this has to be about uh, having good models of the phenomenon, right? That, yeah, like, yeah. Some, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, with that, and it again goes back to my point. If you, I mean, I, I, I mean, again, this this is a mea culpa as much as anything else. But I think in this domain, very often, is, oh, you have this data set. That's great. Nobody else has it, even though you'll tell the journal that you know you, that everybody can replicate your findings, and uh, and so you take that data, you beat the. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the proverbial thing out of it and you publish your results. And essentially your result is, is a redescription, an overfitted redescription of the data that you obtained for that phenomenon. But, if, but I think that it's, it's crucial that, we, we, that, that the analysis that we conduct starts from significant social science questions. And then, and then we, we, we have either generate or find the data that suits uh, the purposes of uh, either falsifying or, ver uh, or verifying the uh, the hypotheses. Um, and, and I guess I would say I, I agree with that part. I also mean a model in terms of adding more structure to allow us to potentially extrapolate or borrow information from different settings, right? I think yeah. sometimes, you know, uh, some of the, um, you know, fashion in some parts of computational social science and even say in applied microeconomics is these very sort of uh, reduced form models that yes, we try to, and I mean, that's somewhat what we've done in this paper. We try to estimate some average effects, et cetera, but this is not really a moder uh, a model of uh, the data generating process in the same way. And so it makes it difficult to say, extrapolate to other settings. And so that's where I think also, especially the epidemiological expertise and being able to incorporate knowledge that may be gained from uh, very particular types of data, even sort of lab setting data into a model could be very helpful. And, and I would also say, yeah, purpose-built data is, a important, is an important aspect of this. I mean, I would say there's huge benefits to uh, making your own data. And I, I know this is something that's discussed at great length in uh, Matt Salganik's book, um, when, you know, when to just sort of use the data you have versus sort of create some new data. And there's huge benefits to that. So I think of like, like you mentioned, um, some of the work by uh, Marcel Salafé and colleagues where they had, uh, you know, uh, proximity uh, uh, tracking across entire high schools and use this to model the spread of the flu. And so then that data, even though it's about the flu, could still be used to tell you something about, wait, what's the normal contact mixing in a high school? Um, and so what kinds of modifications would matter, even if it's, you don't have uh, the flu, uh, you know, the parameters of the regular seasonal yeah. flu are different than that of COVID. That's where a model really model helps. allows you to generalize beyond sort of the specifics of a case study, which in this case is, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, sort of the uh, 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 flu contagion in a high school uh, environment. Yeah, absolutely. We have a related question in the chat um, from Lisa Brogan on self-selection bias. So Lisa asks, uh, is there research about possible self-selection bias in whether people access to record geolocation or not? Uh, self-selection may affect the findings. So that's a question from Lisa and maybe we will already take the second question from the chat to Dean. 
uh, Shyam Ramkumar asks about the social spillover. Uh, so specifically that you mentioned that it is what the what percentage of a random person's social connections are in another area, what data was used to, uh, to construct those connections. So maybe we yeah. will have Tim answering and then Jochen the, the self-selection mm -hmm. bias. Yeah, I mean, I would say the self-selection bias, I mean, I think is relevant to a lot of this, right? So, I mean, just because, uh, you know, uh, I mean, Johan was talking about how, you know, location data on Twitter is this opt-in thing. People often write their location in who knows what ways they might write planet Earth or, you know, a basement somewhere or whatever, right? There's been some nice analyses by, I think, um, Ed Chi and, and colleagues of like, all the kinds of weird things people write in this in this field that can be more expressive than pinning down their actual location. But this also applies to the data that we were working with. And I think, you know, uh, whether uh, somebody is going to appear in the SafeGraph data or the Facebook data, um, there's self-selection involved there. Um, now, and we don't really know much about that self-selection. I think that's one of the challenges. So it's really great that, say, SafeGraph and Facebook are making this mobility data widely available to academics and other researchers at nonprofits. Um, but, uh, the, you know, the details of that self-selection process are not really known to us. Our hope was that part of the credibility of the results actually comes from the fact that we have both of them, right? So I think part of what's driving self-selection is like, who knows exactly which app SafeGraph is getting data from, right? Um, and then, uh, and that's going to be some sample of people and then in Facebook is this other app that has wide distribution, but who actually has this location history feature turned on. And that intersection may be partially overlapping. So these data may be about a bunch of the same people, but they also may be about different people and have different biases. And so you could imagine trying to formalize that uh, in some sort of um, sensitivity analysis framework. I, I would think of doing something along the lines of the work that Paul Rosenbaum is known for thinking, okay, how large does some of these sample selection uh, biases have to be to um, really dramatically change my results uh, a lot? Now, I would, I would note that you know, one kind of self-selection is, are you in the sample at all? And then you assume you're in the sample for the whole time. Okay, that's potentially bad because it means that things are not representative. People are excluded from the analysis. This doesn't really tell us about what everyone is doing. It tells us about what this weird set of people is doing. Even worse, is if you're excluded from the sample at different time periods, that is not in fact a fixed panel. And my understanding is that this does happen in the safe graph data, where essentially one of the things that has happened during this period of time is people were using apps that are useful when they're out and about, and those apps request their location data. Now people don't go out and about and they just stop using the app, they delete the app. Um, now they exit the safe graph panel. So that's actually like endogenous sample selection over time, potentially in response to the very treatments that we're trying to understand and correlated with the outcomes in a way. So that is bigger challenge. My hope would be, that's again a point where the Facebook, the Facebook and SafeGraph data are providing us a bit of a picture. So of course, some people might be, you know, deactivating Facebook or removing it from their phone to try to cut down on their social media use because we know social media use has spiked during this time as well. So there could be both of those biases in, in play. Uh, so I didn't answer the other question, but I, maybe I will in, in chat, but I'd be interested to get Johan's thought on the self-selection as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it, we get this a lot, of course, because working with Twitter, right? And the, sort of the Twitter sample has been smaller than the Facebook sample of the overall population. And the, you know, I work, uh, uh, you do quite a bit of work in, in, in mental health, right? And then I spoke to some of the clinical psychologists on our team about this. And what they tell me is that self-selection sample, even in sort of electronic health records, is almost un unavoidable, right? Because, I mean, the, the, this is really sort of the, 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 the major problem with sort of data-driven approaches to science. And the, the, the anecdote that, that stuck with me is that they told me that, that most clinical psychologists, especially therapists, usually say that the patients, the depressed patients they see are a very biased self-selected sample. Why? Because they, they're depressed patients that decided to go see a doctor in the first place. And since 
since deciding to go see a doctor, leave the home and, and make an appointment, etc., in and of itself has a bearing on the on the the effect that you and, and, and the mechanics of the effect that you're trying to measure. And so the I, I think that it's it, I mean I think you just have to again it's it, 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 you know it's I think the horse is dead by now but the you it, it, a, sort of an understanding of the mechanics and the dyna dynamics of the phenomenon that you are studying will help you to mitigate I think to a degree the self-selection bias and determine whether a suspected self-selection bias is relevant to the phenomenon that you're studying. For example, in our studies of mental health, we look at interpersonal dynamics and we're looking at sort of mood dynamics and how the parameters of those mood dynamics could contain early warning signals for transitions to sort of a pathological state within the subject. And so you can assume that these are universal and the, the, the self-selection bias on Twitter is not relevant for that within subject phenomena that you're studying. Now it would become a problem if we're trying to estimate general population morbidity. Right, because it, your sample is not representative and it's self-selected. So, I, 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 you know, I, I, I can't give a good answer. It's just a, a matter of, of, of conducting good science and being aware of the biases in your samples and mitigating, mitigating for, for to the greatest degree uh, possible. Uh, but yeah, social media samples are definitely self-selected. And I, I, Dean, I'm happy you brought this up as well. This is a major issue. For example, even within subject. The subjects when people's mental state suffers, for example, in mood disorders, their, their motivational state uh, changes as well, and they become less motivated to tweet. So you might have a gap of two weeks where someone isn't tweeting. And so you, you simply don't have a measurement at that point, and the, the, the individual self-reports are simply not included in your analysis. So we work very hard to mitigate these kind of uh, biases, but, but I, I think it's an almost inevitable part of, of conducting data-driven uh, uh, science and not experimental science where you actually uh, uh, put people in a lab and subject them to a variety of exper experimental conditions and observe the outcome. So uh, I think the potential is enormous because of the scale, the temporal resolution, et cetera. But we just have to, as scientists, we just have to be aware of the biases that our samples carry, including the self-selection uh, bias. But there's also social conformity bias. You know, people go on, on social media and they portray sort of persona of themselves uh, that might not be correct. Uh, I mean, as, as we saw in our results, if you look at people communicating strictly about COVID-19, there's a lot of boosterism, a lot of Polyanish stuff. And, uh, but if you look at the, their more personal self-reflective tweets, then they become more negative. So it's not a good answer, I know. It's just, it, it, I think it's just scientists doing their jobs and being careful about the samples that they study. Thank you, thank you, Johan, thank you, Dean. Uh, let's maybe collect two more uh, questions from people who raised their hands. Uh, I see like a lot of questions in the chat, uh, but let's take those two uh, from Michael Haliasos and Christopher Carroll, uh, and then we will slowly wrap up our discussion. Uh, Michael? Yes, thank you. Uh, fascinating talks and fascinating discussion. I, I had a question um, more directed to Dean's uh, paper. I liked very much the idea that um, you're not looking only at what is happening uh, in one's own area, but also in neighboring areas and in socially connected areas. Um, are you able to decompose this effect into um, saying a, an imitation effect, you know, my friends are self-isolating mm -hmm. and I'm imitating them, I'm learning from them, uh, and to a more uh, sort of um, fundamental mechanical uh, thing that uh, if my friends are self-isolating, there are fewer people to visit, there is a smaller reason for me to, to go out, you know, that kind of uh, thing. Are you able to decompose that maybe with your data? Let's yeah, I think one more a, question from, uh, from Christopher so that we can take them together. Uh, Christopher Carroll? Yeah, so um, there may be some extent to which my question is related to Michael's, but um, I've done some work on trying to, I'm an economist, I've done some work on trying to um, project the um, consumer spending uh, response to the crisis. And uh, the uh, thing that kept occurring to me was um, it, one would imagine that it's closely connected to 
the mobility data, um, but the mobility data maybe is available a lot earlier than anything that we have on consumer spending. Um, so it would be interesting both from the sort of structural modeling point of view um, and just from a sort of real time uh, analysis of uh, what's going on uh, to be able to connect the social mobility data to retail sales at the county level or something like that. Yeah, I guess I can say a little bit about both of those things. And so, um, uh, you know, we we definitely want to not say that the only reason there's spillovers is because of sort of this long distance uh, social influence via social media and other mediated communication. Um, we think, uh, you know, some of it is happening locally. And I, I skipped over that part, but in the paper, we have a dyadic model that looks at actually how movement between counties is changing in response to the two counties policies. And so that does play a role in it. But a lot of the social connectedness is actually much more long distance. And so it's really not people uh, moving around. Um, and so, uh, you know, this, these are places that are hundreds of miles away, uh, though there is some of this happening um, at, the, at the border level. And I think it's actually interesting to think about, okay, what's, what's happening with, um, uh, uh, with the economic aspect of this? And so uh, as I maybe sort of skipped over um, from the SafeGraph data, we are able to look at how many visits are to different um, uh, NAICS uh, codes in terms of the industry classification of the location. And so that's actually part of what we use to construct our shift share instruments that allow us to look at, well, how much was this county exposed to people going to different types of places? And then as there's a national reduction in people going to those types of places, then we expect that place to, you know, have reductions in mobility. And so um, SafeGraph does provide that kind of industry specific uh, data. Um, now, it's not clear to me, you know, when that's sort of going to be better or worse data than uh, looking at some of the other kind of uh, consumer spending panels. So I think of uh, data sources like Second Measure that aggregates a lot of data from credit cards. Um, and so that, uh, and that they're also um, uh, interested in collaboration with academics that can share especially aggregated data with academics. Um, so, uh, uh, that um, that could also provide some of that same signal. I know that there's been some work, I think by, um, was this the Chicago Fed? Uh, looking at um, uh, that second measure data and also comparing it with the mobility data uh, itself. So I'm not sure which one ends up being a leading indicator, et cetera, because also one of the things that's happening in the pandemic is things are shifting uh, online or people are buying things in different ways. And of course that could again, raise a bunch of these issues with the biases in the data, right? If I have two credit cards and uh, one I often use online and the other one is the one I'm more often using in per person, right? And only one of those is in the second measure panel of credit cards, then actually there could be biases in the shift that would happen. We hope that my bias is canceled out by somebody else's bias going the other direction, but who knows, right? Also, you can sort of lose detail of the data. Maybe I'm purchasing more things via um, Apple. And so it just says Apple on all these things that I'm purchasing. But really, I'm buying lots of different things through you know, the App Store. I mean, Apple's getting a 30% cut of everything. But uh, right, that there's some shift in the mode of consumption uh, that may uh, mask or bias our understanding of what's happening economically in this sort of higher frequency data. Yeah, I should say I should mention here that we're actually doing a, a pretty large scale survey of uh, about 800 million Alibaba users and uh, looking at their actual purchases over time. And uh, I mean, there's some early indications. We haven't published the work yet, uh, um, but there's some early indications that people do change their purchasing behavior in response to pandemic, obviously. And it's not just a, a run on toilet paper. You can actually since the Alibaba data actually has demographics, you can actually look at, we'll, we'll also have Wi-Fi data so we can determine whether people are part of the same Wi-Fi network at home, for example, which gives some indication of whether, whether they're part of a sort of an extended family or a smaller family, whether they have small kids in the, in the, in the household. And you can see, clearly see not just the run of toilet paper, but also uh, changes in the purchase of things like diapers, 
uh, toiletries, disinfected, etc., that might may be leading indicators. At least this is for this is for China. So we're we're not sure whether sort of delays in reporting the actual numbers might be factored in there as well. So the data only gives a partial view, but it, but at least it's it, it's it's possible to study sort of. Uh, sort of changes in purchasing behavior down to the micro level for specific demographics and combine that with uh, Wi-Fi data to study people's um, social uh, uh, changes in people's social relationships. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Johan. I, I believe we could like continue like this for an hour, uh, but we need to let this meeting for like another discussion that we have like uh, within six festivals so Maria if you could just wrap up and conclude our discussion for today if you want. yeah thank you very much we are being aware of, of the time thank you all for participating thank you Johan and Dean for for all the the lessons learned but also for inspiring all the questions that still remain open I think one of the most important learnings of today is that uh, we are by nature uh, social beings and uh, we are influenced uh, by everyone, uh, but everyone else's uh, behavior around. And uh, all these ideas and, and questions that remain open on how geographic and, and social spillovers affects everyone's behaviors in the context of the pandemic that, 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 uh, or post-pandemic that we are, are very important and very uh, relevant to continue analyzing to know how to address the, all this in the future. Um, thank you very much all again and uh, yeah, hope to see you and uh, interact with you in the future as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>